Well, good morning, friends. It is great to be with you on this beautiful day. Uh, this is the Sabbath day, Sunday, the day of rest, the day of renewal, the day of, of just being renewed in our spirit and, and refreshed by the Lord our God. And part of the way that we do that is come together in a time of worship where we dig into the Word, where, where we listen to the message, where we sing and proclaim the, the great glories of our God. So friends, let us enter into worship. to be together and worshiping and singing the praises of our God. And as we come into a time of prayer, I think about that praising and I think about how it is how we actually open the Lord's Prayer. When, you know, we open with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When you think about that, it's basically hallowed, holy, exalted, and that we are just really naming the nature of our God and just giving praise for that. As we move through that Lord's Prayer, there's points where we give thanks to God, where we seek God for, for our daily bread, for our, our daily sustenance and strength and help in every circumstance, and for our help as we seek to resist evil and resist the ploys that Satan would use to try, try to derail us and get us off the path. And then we close that prayer again with a, an exalting of God saying, for thine be the kingdom and the power and the glory. And friends, uh, I think about that prayer and really that, that prayer lifts up images of what our life should look like, uh, of how we should magnify the, the glory of our God in, in all that we are and all that we do, that we should always be giving praise to our God, uh, just be giving glory to our God and seeking the, the guidance and help and, and, and the, the teaching of our God in every moment. And so let's go into a time of prayer now. Gracious God, you are so good. You are the glorious one, the holy one, the one who is, is righteous, who is perfect. And Lord God, when we look at our lives and we look at the, the rebellion in our lives, we look at the rebellion in, in humanity as a whole, almost from the, the beginning of time, 
And Lord, you have poured out, instead of, of, of wrath and anger and, and abandonment, you have poured out mercy and grace and your incredible love into our lives. Lord, I think of your words in, in John 3, where it says, Heavenly Father, you sent your Son into the world to save the world. And then you go on to proclaim that you did not send him here to condemn it, but to make us anew. And so, Lord, we stand in your presence again today. We hunger for you to transform our minds and our hearts that we may be more like you. Lord, we look out upon this world and, and over the past weeks, we've been so pained by what's been going on. And yet, Lord, it's clear through your word, the way that we bring about transformation is to start with ourselves. To start with seeking you and asking you to transform our hearts and transform our minds that we may think and feel and act as you would. And so Lord, as we come this day, this is my prayer. That by your Holy Spirit, you would transform our thinking. You would transform our hearts. You would make us into your kingdom children. And you would use us to bless the world around us. Father, you've poured out your incredible love in the sending of your Son. And he showed his deep love upon the cross as he gave his life in place of ours. That we might have not just life as existence, but that we might have abundant life. Life in, in your presence and in your power. And that we would be your ambassadors and your witnesses in this world. And, th and that we would be those whom you could send to bring transformation. Not by our strength, but by your Holy Spirit working through us. And so, Father, we pray for that this day. And in one voice, we unite, praying the words that our Savior first taught. Praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, friends, are you ready to get into the Word this day? You know I love to get into the Word, and you know, every time I do this on the video, I just sit there and I, I imagine heads nodding or, or, or people responding with, yes, you know, it's like, because that is it. We, we love that the Lord has given us the Word, and, and that through this Word that, that was spoken so many years ago, we continue to be fed and nourished and guided, and, and then we are given the indwelling Holy Spirit that we've been celebrating over these last weeks, the Holy Spirit that resonates with everything that is in the Word and in fact speaks to us and teaches us and grants us understanding of everything that the Word says. On top of that, reminds us of everything that Jesus said. And, you know, I mean, I've often been, been one who I thought, you know, what, how incredible it would have been to walk with Jesus, to be one of the disciples, to be in his presence. Would that affect the, the way that I live my, my, my Christian life? And, and I, I believe that for a lot of years, that it's like if, if I just had that opportunity, um, I, I'd walk differently. But then there was a point where I came face to face with the fact that I do have that opportunity. To walk with Jesus is to walk with God. And to walk with the indwelling Holy Spirit is to walk with God. And it's not, I mean, we even get a greater blessing because while the disciples walked with Jesus side by side, we, we walk with the indwelling presence of God and the Holy Spirit. And so we're continuing our journey on the Holy Spirit this week. And I, I've had a great time, and this is actually the, the I'm going to say the concluding sermon in this series, but we're going to keep coming back to the Holy Spirit as we go through this year and the years to come because this is such an important part 
uh, of growing in our faith relationship, such an important part of our lives. And, and as I said a few, a few messages ago, that it, because of how the Holy Spirit was, was cut off, what well, was not taught about in the church, and was, uh, you know, anybody who practiced uh, some of the, the gifts of the Spirit or, or making reference to the Spirit, it was kind of, they were shut down and they, they were, they were kind of put down in a lot of churches. And so that, that we're literally in our, our infancy or, or in maybe our toddler stage in terms of, of our walk with the Spirit. And what I love is that God doesn't, God doesn't condemn us for that. God doesn't point his finger and say, you should have never been there. Or, um, and God doesn't expect us to say, okay, now that I'm aware of the Spirit, I, I can make this leapfrog jump from being an infant in the Spirit to being mature in the Spirit. It doesn't work like that any more than anything else. It takes time of training and learning to walk together just like any relationship, just like, like any learning. And so this week as we, as we dig in, I, I want to dig in with some, into a, an idea that I, I think you'll relate to. I wonder, has there always been a longing for God in our lives? Even before we ever accepted Christ, has there always been a longing for God in our lives? Or if I look out to somebody who, who isn't walking in the path of Christ, they, they, they aren't you know, seeking to, to worship Christ, they don't believe, they don't. Is there something in their life that evidences that there is a longing for God in their lives? And I started really wrestling with us, and I thought about some of the basic things that we seek in life, that, that we want love and happiness and peace and contentment. And I mean, there's other things that we can add to that list, but I think of what people are doing in order to achieve those things. I, I watch in, in the element of wanting love, I watch people enter into relationships, and, and I sometimes hear them say, oh, I've, I've found the one, I'm so happy, I know this is it, and I feel so loved, and, and, and then I meet them two months later, and that relationship's gone, and they're on to a new one. And, 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 and I've known some people that have just gone through relationship after relationship after relationship, because they're looking for that right one that can make them truly feel loved. And all the other is just they, they feel loved for a time while it's new and exciting and and you have to begin to wonder is there is there something wrong in, in how they're pursuing love I think of how people pursue happiness that I mean we want happiness in our life and that's one of the the promises that God wants to bring into our lives he wants a happiness and a joy to to fill us from the inside out but the way we try to fill it is from the outside in. We, we try to attach on to things that will make us happy. And so we have a world that promises us all sorts of ways to be happy. If you just own this, if you just do that, and, and so often we can look at our lives and we can see that thing that, that made us feel happy for a very short amount of time, and now it, it's in the junk pile, or it's in the back closet, or it's passed on to somebody else, and, 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 or now it's just laying there unused, and we may still be making payments on it. Um, we, we have this thing where we get addicted to things that society says, this will make you happy, this will make you satisfied, this will be, be all that you need in order to have that life of contentment, that life of happiness, that life of love, that life of... And then I think about the image of peace. How many people live with, with an internal turmoil? I mean, just constantly. They're living with that internal turmoil, and I think a lot of it is because the love quotient's not met, the happiness, the contentment is not being met, and so there's kind of this internal discord, this, this absence of peace. And I wonder if all these things are evidence that there is a longing in us for something that the world just can't satisfy and that before we come to know Christ, before we come to walk with God, we believe it's something in the world, because that's the world, what the world keeps preaching to us. But once we come to know Christ, we learn that these things can only be met in the Lord our God. Only God can bring us true contentment, can bring us true peace, can, can really fill us with love and teach us what, what, what love really is and help us to discover love in a relationship, not by finding the perfect person who can do it right according to our standard, but by discovering that love is something not that we get, but rather something we give. And that's just obviously the, the tip of the iceberg. Everything that we want that's significant in our lives tends to be something that God is saying, if you will just have a relationship with me, 
I, I will satisfy those needs. We, we, we call them desires or wants, but really they're, they're core needs in our life that we were created to have. We were created to be in a loving relationship with the Lord our God. We were created to be a people who are at peace in our relationship with God. We were created to be a people who, who are live in a contentment provided by our God. But all that changed many thousands of years ago in a garden when Adam and Eve decided to, to fracture that relationship, and we've been fracturing it ever since. And, and, and so there's this brokenness, and in our humanness there, we try to do things in a worldly way to, to still have the relationship with God, but it's kinda, it becomes almost legalistic. It becomes what we think needs to be done, and then we take hold of life our way. How did Adam and Eve do it? As soon as, as there was a fractured relationship, as soon as all of that changed and they weren't finding that, that peace and happiness and contentment from God, their way to deal with it was to sew up fig leaves so they wouldn't have to deal with the embarrassment of being naked and to hide. Have we changed at all in our lives? And so as people are denying the existence of God or denying that God should have any place in their life, isn't that another way of hiding? And they continue to pursue the things that the world keeps offering and promising that this will bring you happiness and contentment and, 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 and uh, peace and, and love and, and everything that you could imagine. But they never do. And that, that, that junk heap just keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the trail of train wreck relationships just keeps on growing because we're trying to fill a hole inside of ourselves that, that is the shape of the Holy Spirit and the size of eternity. And we're trying to do it with things of this world. It, it, it's, it's amazing how long and how far we can convince ourselves of that because it's really easy right now for us to say, well, we know that God, it's God that fills that, that void. It's God that provides us with the peace and with the love and with the contentment and with the happiness and joy in our lives. My question is, do we live it? Because as much as we know it and as much as we can point our finger at, at people out there who, are, who aren't living in the relationship, even we who know Christ are continually drawn back in or fall back in to that world, that way that we used to think, where we still latch on to those things sometimes, thinking that that's what is going to make our lives better. Hopefully we're, we're maturing as Christians, and as we mature more and more and more, we, we let go of those things more and more. But right now, we need to deal with them face to face. Because if there are things that, that, that are still present in our life, then they are robbing us of the true joy. They are robbing us of the true contentment. They are robbing us of the true love and the relationship God intended us to have because we're still doing it our way. We're still sowing our fig leaf and hiding in the bushes. So I want to take us this morning to Ephesians. We're going to be digging into the fourth chapter. And this is the Apostle Paul talking. And uh, I, I, I love Paul's teaching. I love it because Paul was one who he thought he had it figured out. And it was a very legalistic kind of life that that is what would please God. And then Paul has his world turned upside down as he has an encounter with God on the road to Emmaus. And in that encounter, his life transforms and then God ultimately raises him up to, to be the one who would witness to many others. There is no one in the Bible that we hear more about the Holy Spirit from than Paul. And he witnesses about it, not as a teaching, not as an external thing, not as a lesson that he got taught, but as something that he experiences in his own life. And friends, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear somebody talk about their own testimony. And so he's talking to the Christians in the church in Ephesus. We're going to pick up at, at verse 17 of chapter 4. And it says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. So I, I want to draw a little disparity here, because this may sound a little confusing, or you may not have caught what he said there. He said, you must no longer live in, as Gentiles do. The challenge is, is that Ephesus is a... A Gentile city. And so what he's talking about here is not a citizenship, but an old mindset. In other words, I do it my way. I do it apart from God. I do it without the... That's what Paul's referring to in, in that, that futility. So he says, he says, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their, their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of ignorance. 
that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. And so you hear this image that Paul draws here, and he talks about, you know, they're full of all impurity, they're filled with greed, their minds are darkened, they live in ignorance. And we immediately, as Christians, say, wow, you know, I know I don't want to, I don't want to live like that. I mean, I remember when I used to, but I'm not like that anymore. But think about this. What Paul's giving is a warning here. He's saying, I'm insisting that you no longer live like that. In other words, some of them, some of them who identified as Christians in the church in Ephesus were still practicing or were still embracing some of those old lifestyles. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't be giving the warning, right? Pretty obvious. Let's continue on in verse 20. He says, That, however, is not the way of life that you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so I think about this this image that Paul is lifting up where he says, you need to, to put off your old self, to put off your old way of doing things and to put on the new self. The new self, where does that come from? How do we learn that? Well, last week we learned about the, the uh, fruit of the Spirit. And in that fruit of the Spirit, the image is that God has, has placed this image, this new self, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gen- that is in us, that is the new self that we're to be led by, that we're literally to be led by God in the, in the righteousness and the goodness and the holiness of God. But we still have these old desires, these old habits that are always going to be there. You see, we spent many years in them. Many years indulging them. Many years believing that that was the way to get happiness. That was the way to get contentment. That was the way to get love. That was the, and that's what Paul warns. He goes, remember when you were in that old way of thinking, that delusional way like the Gentiles, don't let yourself be sucked back into that. He he literally puts it as an old way of life and a new way of life. In another passage, he talks about it being like your old coat or your old cloak and your new cloak. He goes, you need to take that thing off. You need to shed that. You need to take that old life. You need to shed it completely. Don't let yourself be deceived. Because here's the thing. When we think about those pathways that we once walked, those ways that we once believed, that those were a part of our life, they were integrated into our everyday, and the world has not stopped preaching them. The people that we have to be around, where we work and where we play and where we fellowship and where we hang out and where we, just like the Gentiles in these days, these Gentile Christians, they're still encountering these fellow townspeople and they're, they're having to encounter this kind of thinking. Now, maybe they didn't have the public ads like we do today that come across the internet and TV and radio and, and, and everywhere that you can look that keep on saying, come, take hold of this and you can be happy. Come, take hold of this, you can be content. Come, take hold of this and you can know peace. Maybe it wasn't as publicized, but the messages haven't changed in all of the years. And those things are enticing. They're enticing because to our flesh, they're familiar. And when something's familiar, it has that that potential to kind of reach out and kind of latch on with its tentacles. And if we're ones who just say, okay, I've put off that old life. I'm in Christ now. Life is good. Um, I I go to church. I I read my Bible here and there. I pray here and there. um, Or maybe you do it every day. Maybe you're you're very disciplined in that. But, But think about what Paul is saying here. He says, put off your old self with its deceitful desires. In other words, there is an old self that's still there that you need to keep putting off because its desires will lead you astray. It will latch on to those worldly things. He says, put it off and be made new in the attitude of your minds. In other words, have your minds completely transformed the way that you think, the way that you understand where happiness and love and joy and peace and contentment actually come from. So be made new in the attitude of your your minds and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. In other words, tap into that power of the Holy Spirit that's there, but if you don't tap into the power source, then you don't live in the power source. I mean, it can exist 
You know, it's kind of like sitting there and, you know, I mean, I've got a beautiful vacuum cleaner, but unless I plug it into the wall, I mean, I can run that thing across the floor all day long. It's not going to do anything. We have to plug into the power source of the Holy Spirit. We need to listen to the Spirit and allow the Spirit to shape our minds, to shape the way that we think, and thus to shape the way that we act in our lives. It is so important that we do this second part. Because if we, this is why kind of diets don't work. Diets so often are driven by this. Okay, what I need to do is I need to cut out my bad foods. I cut out the bad things. I know the things that are high in fat or high in carbs. And if you think about most diets, that's what they do. I need to cut out my sugars, cut out my fats, cut out my carbs, cut out my flours, cut out my... How many diets talk about what you put in place of that? There actually aren't a lot. Most of them are all about what you need to cut out. And if you don't put something in, when you sit there and finally hit that, that threshold of, I can't do this anymore, you have that day where you just kind of break, what do you go for? You go for what's familiar because you haven't trained yourself in a new way. You haven't trained yourself to, to be choosing something different. You know how long it takes to establish a new habit? This, this was shocking to me. I just learned this. Four weeks. And that doesn't guarantee that you can't be tripped up. That just says to establish a new habit in your life takes four weeks. How often do we sit there and we, we try to root out this old self? We don't put anything in the new self in. We just say, well, I'm going to resist sin. I'm going to resist that bad path. I'm going to resist those urges. I'm going to resist taking hold of worldly pleasures that promise happiness and peace. I'm going to resist that. How long before we feel so empty inside, do we go back and grab hold of those addictions that once fed us? Because see, we, we still have the need. The need hasn't changed. Our need for love, our need for happiness, our need for contentment, our need for peace does not change. It's always going to be there. And if we don't feed it with something, we're going to go back and grab what we used to feed it with. And so Paul urges us with, Every, every ounce of urgency that he can say. He, he says, you have got to allow your minds to be transformed. You have got to pursue that new life. You need to put it on. So friends, as, as we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, we talk about how, how God is so committed to working in our lives, but we have to be in agreement. We have to let go of the world. In other words, we need to let go of our control and our way of saying, I'm going to figure out my own path of happiness. I'm going to figure out my own path of contentment. God has given us this, this great gift. I want to take you to one more passage. And I was kind of debating whether to go here. But I think it's so important we, we hear how, how God works and how committed to us God is. This comes out of 1 Corinthians in the second chapter, and it picks up in verse 9. It said, It is written, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. So the things God has prepared for those who love him are revealed only by the Spirit. You can't figure it out in your mind. You can't figure it out in your heart. You can't just be determined to understand. It doesn't work. It's only revealed by the Spirit. It says, The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thought of God, the thoughts of God, except for the Spirit of God. And what we have received is not a spirit of the world, but the spirit, of, the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Think about that. That, that kind of relates back to our other passage, doesn't it? It's like we choose to put off the old way, the worldly way, that to satisfy our, our, our needs, and to put on the new way, to find it in what the Spirit will lead us in and will teach us and will guide us in every day. And it's saying here, God's gifted this to us. And, and we don't need to live by that Spirit of the world. God has given us His very Spirit. It says in here, it says, This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual rea realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness, and cannot understand them because they are discerned 
only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. So, uh, in other words, what he's saying is that Spirit is so essential, but unless we are living by the power of the Spirit, unless we are walking in that, we are going to consider the ideas that are presented in Scripture, the ideas that the Spirit tries to convince us of, the ideas that Christ teaches, the ideas that other Christians teach, we're going to think they're as foolish as those who are still living in that Gentile mind. We, we have the indwelling Spirit when we accept Christ, but if we leave the Spirit in the silent recesses and we aren't listening, we aren't embracing the power, we are in, almost in the same position as those who have never received Him. I mean, it's one thing to not have the Spirit. It's another thing to say, I have the Spirit, but... I'm not going to listen. We're putting ourselves in the same camp. And that is why Paul warns in the very beginning of chapter 4, or in verse 17 of chapter 4, he goes, I tell you, and I insist on this in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, hear the words again, in the futility of their thinking. In other words, never listening to what the Spirit is saying. They think they got it figured out. They think they know how to do it. Friends, we live in a world where there's a lot of people that think they've got it figured out. They think they know how to have happiness and contentment and all of our needs met. They think they know how to have real love. Well, all we have to do is take a look out on the world and we see the absence of those things so prevalent in so many lives. Friends, I believe that God has given us a gift that is incomparable. I know God has given us a gift that is incomparable. God has given us the indwelling spirit that we may be filled to overflowing. Let us embrace it. Let us step every day into the rich power of the spirit. And when we face those days, because like I said, we're, we're infants and toddlers. When we face those days where we're like, wow, the, the enticement of the world and, and the old way of my flesh, the old way of my leanings to satisfy those needs, boy, they're screaming out really loud. And from all appearances, I think it might work in, in this situation or with this object or with this thing or, or with, you know, with this person. Or, you, 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 there is such a strong draw there. And this is where we get to grow. This is where we get to move from infancy to toddler, or we get to move from toddler to, to, to young childhood, and we get to move from every time we say, okay, God, there's a part of me that believes that I know better and that I should latch on to this worldly thing, but I believe your word, I believe the promise of your spirit, and so I'm going to trust you. Holy Spirit, teach me and fill me as only you can. And lead me day by day in, in, in baby steps or toddler steps or child, whatever it is. If we're willing to walk with God, God will meet us in that place and lead us and grow us. If our answer is every time God seems to maybe not be hitting the mark or, or we feel like God might be coming up short or the world has a better offer, I don't know how it does, but every time if it seems that, that there's a, something that enticing, if we say, well, let me go try this out. We're basically relegating ourselves to a constant spinning place of staying in that stage of infancy. We're saying, let me go try this. Oh, that didn't work. I'll come back here. Oh, let me go try this. Oh, that didn't work. I'll come back here. We just keep on going back to infancy. God's saying, will you just trust me? Let that go. Trust me. Trust the lead of the Spirit and begin to know what it is to mature in the Spirit so that those things lose their enticement and you begin to find life is here. Life is is in God. Uh, one of my favorite scripture passages, and I'm not going to be able to quote you chapter and verse right now, but one of my favorite scripture passages is this, and it's just a phrase. I'm not even going to tell you the whole passage. It says, and Christ, who is your life. That's our promise. Christ, who is our life, who died on the cross for us and then sent us the Holy Spirit to indwell us and to bring life, abundant life to us that ultimately wells up into eternal life where we spend eternity with our God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you the praise, the glory, the honor, and we thank you. Lord, we know that we lean back into the world and, and all of its empty promises, and we so desperately need your help Spirit, we need the strength to, to throw off the old self, to throw off that old coat, that old way of thinking, to throw it off and leave it on the ground, to leave it behind, and to lean into you, to allow you to transform our thinking, to renew our minds, 
to truly transform our lives. So God, thank you for not abandoning us, but for loving us so much that you died for us, that you dwell within us, and that we are sealed for all eternity. Praise your holy name. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I to worship with you. We talk about this life of, of living in the power of the Spirit, of letting go of, the, of our old worldly ways and the enticements that you just keep, want to keep on grabbing a hold of us and promising us that, that all of our needs, that all, of, all that we, we, we desire in life to fulfill life, that will somehow be met through those worldly paths. We know they won't that it's only in Christ, that it's only through the teaching and, and the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But here's my promise to you. You may not make it through the day before Satan decides to take a swing. And if you do make it through today, I promise you, you're going to get up tomorrow and you are going to face it head on where Satan is going to take a swing and that swing in some way, shape, or form is going to say this. What you were just told is not right. It's inadequate. You can't do it all with God. You've got to have some of these things out in the world. I don't know what the enticement's going to be, but Satan is going to swing hard. And here's my encouragement, through the encouragement of Scripture, through the words of Paul, don't let yourself be drawn back into that way of thinking. Guard your mind and guard your heart and keep trusting and walking with the Holy Spirit that God said, I love you so much, I've placed it inside of you. Friends, let us go forth in the love and in the power of Almighty God. Amen. <laughs>